थैंक यू डॉक्टर मनोज श्रीवास्तव जी ये हैव एलेबरेटली एक्सप्लेन ऑन द इनिशिएटिव इन्फ्लुएंस इंस्पायर द इनिशिएटिव लाइक सफल एंड स्का स्कूल क्वालिटी एक्रेडेशन और असेसमेंट एंड एश्योरेंस दैट वी हैव बीन टॉकिंग ऑम आई थिंक सी बी एस सी हैज़ डन विद दिस टर्मिनोलॉजी कॉल सॉर्ट ऑफ वट कॉल यू आर टॉकिंग अबाउट असेसमेंट एंड एश्योरेंस इन योर स्का बट द टर्म एक्रेडेशन हैज बीन रादर डन अवे बाय सी बी एस सी तो we have done it because in this country nothing works unless there is an enforcement so we have integrated this uh, quality assessment framework as a prerequisite to the affiliation process so every new school which is coming to cbse for affiliation mm. will have to undergo a self assessment program uh, that's a so, wonderful idea but what happens is to align it with the terminology used in the nep 2020 it would be my suggestion and request to cbse to include the word accreditation as well that's it thank you you have done wonderful nice now next uh, and you have even stuck to the timing that i think we should clap for him all right it was exactly finished in time we have next speaker uh, dr sona auja rather professor sona auja uh, it has been from dalbag education institution agra and her topic is implementation nap at the dei schools please go ahead thank you Okay the topic of my presentation is implementation of NEP 2020 at DI both schools I'll uh, briefly present the NEP highlights and then how we implement it in our DI both schools now the agenda for sustainable development is reflected in SDG 4 sustainable development goal 4 which seeks to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all by 2030 now this is a lofty goal and the entire world is changing the landscape of the education for this and so has nep also taken the initiative and nep lays emphasis on development of creative potential along with foundational capacities and higher order capacities why nep was not a challenge for us because nep education policy was introduced in 2020 and at dei the entire education system is based on dei education policy which was formulated in 1975 by the founder director of dei most severe dr mb lal sahab and we can see the elements i will uh, discuss most of the elements which are there in nep are being already covered now the education at di started in the form of rei a co educational middle school on 1st january 1917 so school education in di is not new but it's more than 100 years old and gradually uh, we moved to high school high secondary and then it grew to dalbag educational institute a deemed to be university i'll uh, cover the part 1 of nep school education these three eight points what we exactly do in this so beginning with the curriculum and pedagogical structure in school education this is what nep proposes and we have this so at foundational stage we have further divided this into three phases first one beginning from 3 weeks to 4 years so balwatika anganwadi the pre school education at our system begins at 3 weeks and the second cluster is 4 to 6 years 6 to 8 years i'll share what are the activities and how do we implement so the first one is the early childhood care and education the foundation of learning so nep um has emphasized that uh, the need for this is the preschool is that students are school ready before grade 1 and to attain the optimal outcomes in several domains like ranging from physical motor cognitive and so on so what we do is we have introduced a scheme called superman evolutionary scheme at dei so i just a point okay uh, let me just sorry for this trouble yeah i'll mute this so that i can speak and make it faster okay okay so uh this is just a small video uh, which shows what are the activities we have in the superman evolutionary scheme the toddlers as young as 3 weeks are enrolled in the scheme and uh, 
it is uh, in the age group of 3 weeks to 12 years so gradually child moves from informal learning environment to the formal schooling that is through uh, lkg uh, or in the preschool that is nursery to the primary school and this is till 12 years we are connected with them and these are the four clusters and the domains targeted range from physical to spiritual giving the indian knowledge system touch and the location the beauty is the agro ecology com precision farming fields so they learn in the natural environment and no walls which is very close to nature and 489 plus minor centers across the world are connected so these students get the exposure to multiple cultures multiple languages so not only one language so this is just exposure i'm talking about not teaching them anything and the activities that we focus on is environmental awareness since it is in the natural environment self defense training you can see health checkups and recreation for them cultural programs in which all the students from across 489 plus minus 1 centers participate music is the also key element here games and sports and the language development three languages right from 3 weeks they just listen when they are of 3 weeks they start babbling and when they start speaking so all the commands that we give in the self defense training it is in english hindi and sanskrit so three languages this is how we start with at the early childhood Okay, so I'll skip this video. <laughs> this is a big video. Okay, then uh, I've also mapped other points which are missed here. So, NEPC is Anganwadi Balwatika, and it says that it should be co-located and also stand alone. Balwatika should be there. So, what we have is uh, I have already discussed. Uh, so it is in agroecology, come precision farming fields. That is natural environment, which and the uh, all the other schools, the uh, nursery and the primary schools are in the vicinity. So it is standalone and co-located as well. Then NEP says universal access, specially coverage of disadvantaged. So when I say 489 plus minus one centers, we also include tribal and remote areas. So we have developed the internet connectivity, which I presented last year. How did we do it? And so we cover all the all the locations, all the age groups, all the different uh, students with different abilities. And it talks about school complex programs, as I had said that in the video also it was there. So joint programs of all the phases from three weeks up to twelve years is organized. So they get to interact, and peer group learning is there. And so school complex, this we achieve as all the you know levels, the sections are in vicinity to each other. So it is kind of school complex. Then NAP focuses on midday meal. We work in close collaboration with the university. So Department of Home Science plans the midday meal for them, the nutritional food. And health checkups are done by the community hospital. So we have uh, expert doctors, pediatricians, and they regularly monitor the health. That was also shown in the video. And for teacher training, we have workshop organized. I'll talk in point number five of NEP, what else we do for teachers. Then the next is foundational literacy and numeracy, what we do to achieve this. The first one is assessment of minimum learning outcomes. So NCRT has already laid down the minimum learning outcomes up to class eight, and the document was released on 31st January 2017. So what we do is, from these minimum learning outcomes, we do random checks in the school. Now, how do we achieve this? From where do we get the manpower? So as I said that we are uh, working in close collaboration with the university. So students of post pursuing post-graduation in teacher education, that is MED, have to conduct some research as part of their dissertation project. So some of the students undertake such projects wherein they learn how to assess the minimum learning outcomes and what else they can do is like, uh, you know, correlating it with the gender, with the location. So they learn research and this objective is also achieved that the schools are alert that will be tested for our MLOs. Uh, minimum learning outcomes and what else we do is we have summer workshops if at all we find lacuna then we have remedial classes bridge classes and day boarding so um, we have mentors from the community who support us and uh, we have day boarding close to their places and there we organize sessions and we provide them help in the content wherever they, wherever, wherever they have missed in this school 
then we try to maintain the pupil teacher ratio under 30s to 1 which is uh, very good for ECC and then the robust system of continuous formative assessment I would discuss this uh, by what do we mean but what do I mean by formative assessment and how do we implement it and these are the activities which many schools must be doing it okay now this is very important point Mr. Tilang in his presentation said that dropout is a problem and the major reasons that he shared was a lack of interest in academics after class 8th and looking for the employment so what we do is we have the multiple entry exit model that we have adopted since long back what's there in this model is so uh, the red line so, uh, shows the regular progression so a student has choice to pursue his school education from pre-nursery up to class 12th or to leave wherever he wants, like from class 8, if he wants to leave, then he can join the modular courses. So we have a lot of modular courses provided by the Technical College and Women Polytechnic of the university, and also the certificate courses. So they earn the credits, and this gives recognition of their prior learning. So uh, through these credits, they can earn certificates or diploma or degree and so on. And if they want to go back to the system or to the school system after pursuing the modular courses, like very simple courses through which they can earn at least their fees, then they can go back to the system. So this makes them financially independent to some extent and continue their education. So this is the model that we adopt for in reintegrating dropouts and ensuring universal access to education. Now for curriculum and pedagogical practices, NEP says minimization of rote learning, encouraging holistic development. Now this is a very um, term which is in vogue, holistic development. How do we do it? Holistic development. So these are the abilities uh, NEP wants us to develop in the students. So this is our holistic development model. So uh, we have already have skill-based education, all earn while you learn scheme right after class eight. So they can stay in the campus, they can earn, and I can share the model in detail, and then we have tinkering activities. So these are work experience based courses to ensure that they don't drop out because of the financial constraints. And then we have foundational courses and correlated approach. So I'll, uh, uh, I'll skip this and go to the next one. Okay, so these, these are some of the glimpses that will show you what do we mean by holistic development. Working in the uh, agroecological environment, to inculcate the dignity of labor. You cannot develop the dignity of labor by giving them lecture or telling them stories. But they work there in the group and they learn. Indian culture, NCC participation in NCC, games and sports, they get marks for participating in games and sports. So that is incentive for them. So it is part of the, inter it is integral part of the curriculum, games and sports. Yoga, and then how do we achieve the skilling? So we have adult tinkering labs from middle school onwards. And also we have these labs not only in the urban areas, but also in remote areas. Um, Rajabharari, which is a tribal cluster in Madhya Pradesh, Harda district. And this is government project. Government has made it open for all the schools. So you don't have to spend money, your own money. You have to just take the initiative. Then we have do-it-yourself lab in the primary schools, heuristic learning center where trial and error approach discovery approach we encourage let them discover let them find out the knowledge rather than we giving them putting them the information and at high school level we have uh, several courses i'll show you uh, briefly the glim glimpses at middle school level and at primary uh, school level we have supw uh, which is also not new socially useful productive work this is how we begin with the introduction to skilling and uh, Okay, so these are the glimpses of the skilling. So they have music in their course, garment making, food processing, adult tinkering labs, and the use of latest technologies, textile designing. So this is all students are learning, they are doing, and this enables them to earn while learning. So no financial constraints. Okay, now another question was, everybody was saying how to inculcate values and ethics. So again, I said you cannot teach values at all, neither through stories nor through lectures. Stories they may listen, they may remember, make them do it. So we have core courses for the holistic development. So to develop national ethos, we have course on cultural education, right from primary up to university level. 
and then for scientific tempo we have course on general knowledge so these this is integral to the curriculum we have semester system in one semester some of the core courses we offer and in the next semester other courses then for understanding of rural life rural development course humility, humility and dignity of labor uh, agriculture operations it also develops brotherhood of man casteless and casteless classless society social service we have co curricular activities in form of theater literary music cre creativity for all round development again they have weightage for this uh, the marks in the evaluation so that motivates them to participate for healthy body and mind games and sports and for tolerance and sense of national integration we have comparative study of religions as a student of di i also studied several religions so i know about japanese and buddhism and many other religions because i studied it at university level i did not do schooling from the air but yes here students learn it at the school level itself and they themselves find out that the crux of all the religions is same but let them find out it's not that we can say so for that we teach them the they study this course comparative study of religion so this is how this is our plan of action for developing the values then also we have special camps i think i have covered the time i i'll just skip this and uh, this is the um, comprehensive and continuous evaluation system so this i want to focus so we have we daily give them an assignment at the end of the lecture the assignment the length of the assignment is not more than half a page at the max it can be 3/4 of a page and it is based on the application of what is taught in the class today and one day it is subjective and other day it is objective so alternate we do it and at the end of the week it is class assignment so whatever you have studied throughout the week you will be assessed in the class just 5 marks each so this is daily plus weekly assessment then we have class tests twice a semester and sgds that is seminar and group discussions so they select any topic of their choice from the subject they present in the class and their peers ask them the questions peers get marks for asking the questions so they ask the questions they respond so soft skills are developed so we do not need separate soft skills soft skills course so any every subject they have to present an sgd so every student gets to learn how to come in front of the audience and speak and speak for that particular subject maths has its has its own language science has its own language so you cannot just teach them in the language classes the communication and then um, when they have end semester they are so much done with the evaluation that they they have no anxiety and we have tested it this time and again so they do not have any kind of anxiety number one number two we have evaluation of all the components so it is across the domains as i said um games and sports music literary so several domains are assessed through these activities and still we have remedial exams and reevaluation if they want and what do we do about teachers we work in close collaboration with teacher education department and we have two centers in the teacher education department center for artificial intelligence based education again it is government project so you don't have to spend the students money or students fees on it and um, we have one more center that is center for knowledge acquisition retention and transformation how to do it so teachers learn so we so this is continuous professional development they also learn from bed and dled interns so there is continuous interaction between pre service teachers in service teachers and teacher educators and um, th there is a lot of thing to discuss i have done my this thing so like close it okay so there are a lot of points anyways maybe next time thank you chalo thank you <coughs> dr sona auzia you have uh, thoroughly dealt with the di education board uh, you know assessments and you are doing wonderfully well thank you now we have the next speaker uh, ms shamim choudhury from cambridge assessment international education <coughs> please good afternoon Uh, do i have to put the presentation on myself it's okay minimize it minimum yeah you can that's okay you have to close it i have to close it yeah let me let me yeah i'm wondering whether i should overburden you 
with the amount of information that you have already uh, heard today, or <clears throat> Should I be a good teacher and let you breathe? So, what do you want? You want a breather or you want to be overburdened with information? Yeah? I'll be a good teacher. I'll, be, I'll, I'll listen to you. I'll be a good teacher. I promise you. Um, I don't want to get into introductions. Um, I, just to let you know, I represent Cambridge International, which is an exam uh, body. It's an awarding organization based in the UK. I was very pleased to know uh, some of uh, you here probably had taken Cambridge exams uh, many years back when as junior Cambridge and senior Cambridge as well. Um, and we are actually part of the University of Cambridge, so a lot of our work is informed by the research that the university does. So this is all that I'm going to skip, okay? I thought of speaking about three things. I will speak of one thing properly and see if we have more time. Give me a second, please. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about a concept um, which is basically called behavior for learning. Now, a great deal has already been written about the failure of many school systems to prepare students properly for life. And for the modern world. And I think there is too much of attention um, given to preparing students for examinations instead of developing learner habits. I think in the first half, we heard somebody talking about um, how teachers go into classrooms, but they are so preoccupied with all the things that they have not done that they cannot focus on anything more. Now, one dangerous misconception is that Teachers have to teach to the test to get the highest grade for students. That is an assumption. And we know that teaching students to be good learners not only prepares them for life, but it also results in higher grades in examinations and high-stake assessments. Now, behavior for learning is an approach to understand and develop children and young people's behavior that focuses on their relationship with three things. Their relationship with their self, their relationship with others, and with the curriculum. And this promotes readiness for education. I think we have, we are, we have all heard each of us and in, in the, in the, through the day talking about but not actually speaking it out in this language that children are not mostly ready to learn. They do not have the mindset or the tools to learn, as a result of which they are not able to make the best of what is even offered currently. Forget about what is going to happen in a couple of years when there are much more reforms in India. Now, behavior for learning as an approach was actually developed by Dr. Simon Ellis and Professor Janet Todd. The conceptual framework sets out three relationships. And these three relationships represent the emotional, the social, and the cognitive co-curricular factors that influence the development of a learner. The arrows that you see here, they are connecting the three relationships. And this is a reminder that these are not experienced in isolation by the learner. For example, if a, there is a difficulty in forming friendships, which is like a social factor, it may adversely affect how an individual feels about themselves, which is actually an emotional factor. 
Now the term behavior for learning reflects the key principle that the priority of a teacher is to promote learning. And I think that is very often forgotten in classrooms. Therefore, even when selecting a behavior management strategy for a class or for a school, consideration needs to be given to its contribution to the development of learning behavior. The term relationship with the curriculum. Now, what does it actually refer? It refers to the cognitive or the curricular aspects of learning. It encompasses, but it is not limited to, factors such as the learner's ability to tackle the task, how do they organize themselves and their learning, and most importantly, their motivation for the task. I think in many cases, it is the lack of motivation in a learner which hampers anything else. Now, an understanding of how the key components of behavior for learning, conceptual framework linked together supports four main functions, reflective practice, assessment, planning, and monitoring and evaluation. Now, we all work with schools, even we work with schools, we work with schools in around 160 countries, and we, believe me, we have a range of schools which you'll be surprised to hear. We have schools in big cities, but we also have a school in a small town, a rural town in Birbhum in West Bengal. So we, we work with a range of schools, and we know how difficult it is to support schools, especially when it comes to issues about, be, things about behavior for learning. So uh, Ellis and Todd suggested three levels of use for this, as how schools can promote behavior for learning in their learners or students. The first is the extended mode, which basically you focus on strengthening just maybe one or more of these three relationships. The other is the core, where you identify just one relationship and work on it. And then the third way is to do it by day to day through general, general teaching, approach to behavior management, where you protect and enhance the, all the three relationships that are there. Now, what are the learning habits students need to be successful in school, in higher education, in workplace, and in life in general? Now, this question has inspired the development of the Cambridge Learner Attributes. Uh, there are five attributes that we want students who follow the Cambridge curriculum to imbibe. We understand learners' educational experiences as being holistic, inclusive of their cognitive, social, and emotional development. And this gets reflected in our learner attributes as we aim to support schools to develop learners who are confident, who are responsible for themselves, respectful of others, and engage intellectually and socially, ready to make a difference. Now, our mission at Cambridge International is to support schools around the world to give them the students the best education for life. That's what our motto is, education for life. Not just for classroom, not just for cracking tests or getting a score of 90. Our qualifications and educational programs are designed for this very purpose. However, they must be supported by effective teaching and learning and leadership practices. I'll just take five minutes more to talk about what we do in terms of professional development of teachers, and I'll end it there. I hope all of you are still with me. Now, research indicates that effective teacher professional development needs to be integrated into the everyday life of the school and the teacher, and not just exist in silos as trainings. Now, I understand that the NEP 2020 has a section on teachers where it comments that the quality of teacher education and teacher empowerment is not where it should be in India, and that consequently that the quality and motivation of teachers does not reach the desired standards. I'm going to share with you something what we have done when we designed our 
qualifications, professional development qualifications uh, for our teachers. So we have designed a, a teaching and learning diploma and a certificate qualification. Now, when we were designing this, there were two essential principles that underpinned the design of these qualifications. One was effective teaching and the other was effective professional development. The qualifications are inclusive and they are relevant to all teaching and learning context, starting from primary and secondary general education to vocational education and training to further adult and higher education. These qualifications develop not only subject knowledge and skills, but most importantly, they develop attitudes, ways of thinking and behaviors. So we have another program which is on educational leadership. And, and believe me, all these programs are for in-service people, okay? Now, leadership learning is based on the twin concept of active learning and reflective practice. So candidates who come for these programs, they increase their knowledge of relevant theories and research findings that informs and deepens their reflection. And they encourage leaders to increase their knowledge and understanding of how successful leadership should be in the school system. It helps them develop their leadership skills, self-evaluate their approaches to leadership. I think, we, we, I, think I heard somebody talking about you know, students self-evaluating, but are we actually letting teachers, giving teachers or encouraging them to also self-evaluate what the thinking is about how they are teaching? So this kind of reflective practice is typically missing. The certificate and the diplomas that we have are those for who have a leadership role in a school setting and they help leaders to explore and apply new ideas in their own context and integrate new approaches in their own practice and demonstrate the professional development as reflective practitioners. I'm coming to my last slide. Um, so we call them the professional development qualifications, the Cambridge PDQs, and these are benchmarked to the framework for higher education qualifications in uh, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland to level four and level five, respectively. Now what's interesting is each program involves a spiral of professional learning. Each stage being a cycle of experiential learning and reflective practice, which follows from the previous cycle. Now, areas of learning for teachers are revisited systematically within the program. So the design is such that candidates can engage with these in more depth and detail and acquire the related skills and knowledge. There are three key processes that this spiral involves. First is observation, second is reflection, and third is learning with and from mentors. If you can see the screen, you will find that the assessment that we do for these programs is actually a portfolio of evidence. So it's not just attending a training program or writing a test, but they have to submit a portfolio of evidence. Now these processes are crucial and they work together because in that case what happens is teachers receive feedback from their mentors to inform their continuous reflection. So while if you're creating CPDs uh, for teachers, I would suggest that it's important that CPDs are fit for purpose and are designed to help transform the vision that the NAP has spoken about. I'm going to end my session here. I'm around tomorrow. And I'd be happy to have a one-to-one -one chat if you have queries about anything. Thank you so much for patiently listening. Thank you, Mr. Chandan Chaudhary ji. You have thoroughly dealt with the Cambridge Assessment and Education and showcased 
effectively what's going across the board in different countries that 160 countries that you're operating in thank you now next speaker uh, we have mr mahesh balakrishnan ji from international baccalaureate <coughs> you'll be speaking on globalization the modern workplace the transformational impact of an ip education 